Welcome to season four of And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. I've written with hundreds of artists and writers over the years, and my favorite part of each session is the first hour when we catch up about life, the industry, politics, composition, whatever. So this is a journey of learning why people write songs, how people write songs, and most importantly, who the people are who write the songs. I'm producing this with The Great Joe London, Big Deal Music Publishing, and Mega House Music Management. If you want to listen to the songs we discuss in this podcast, follow us on our socials, find out about special events, or buy some of our merchandise, go to our website, www.andthewriteris.com. Oh, and if you enjoy And The Writer Is, please rate and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your preferred podcast listening site is. This week's episode is sponsored by BMI. Full disclosure, Joe and I are both BMI songwriters. So we didn't write this, but we believe it. BMI, we celebrate your talent, value your music, and champion your rights. To all our songwriters and composers, your passion is ours. BMI, music moves our world. Hey, I think it's weird that we as musicians spend so much time in a studio making sure our songs sound amazing And then we go home and we play them on speakers that aren't very good. And my friends at Sonos recently sent me a speaker and I took it out of the box. It took about one minute to set up, to download the app and listen to the music that I had written earlier that day in a studio and have it sound exactly how I wanted it to sound in my own living room. The bass was bumping, the vocal clarity was there, full transparent frequency range, genuinely the experience that I needed to have at an affordable cost because I'm not about to buy my studio monitors for my home theater. And the coolest thing about Sonos is that you could just add more speakers if you want and your app is intuitive. It'll help you set it up. So it's so simple. It's so easy. I recommend that if you need a speaker at home or even if you don't and you want to try a better one, they're pretty affordable. So go to www.sonos.com. You can play Apple, Spotify, whatever your streaming service is. Um, And and it's just that easy. You're going to order it. It's going to show up at your front door and you're going to open it and you won't be sorry. Again, go to www.sonos.com. Welcome to And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. Today's Grammy-winning super producer has taken his literal worldly background to the tippy top of the urban and pop charts. He burst on the scene with records on classic artists like Alicia Keys, Jennifer Lopez, and Rihanna, but has since defined some of the newest names in music with songs like Here and Scars Here Beautiful for Alicia Cara. He also helped reinvigorate Demi Lovato with their four times platinum hit Sorry Not Sorry. Not bad for a kid from Istanbul, Turkey. That said... His most impressive trait, in my opinion, is how he controls the session as well or better than any producer with whom I've ever worked. By way of Atlanta and Sherman Oaks, this gentleman believes in creating a healthy music industry for the next generation of up-and-coming songwriters. So he knows his way into my heart. And the writer is the only guy I know who has designated indoor sneakers for the studio... Oak Felder. <laughs> How you doing, man? You're really good at that. Thanks, man. Yeah, you're amazing at that. I feel like I'm getting, it's like, a, you know, if people have been listening since episode one, right. I, I think they're probably hearing an improved version. No, it's, <laughs> go back and listen to episode one and yeah, it's like it before and after. It ain't like that. Oh, um, man, that's really cool. It, uh, Makes me sound great. You know, honestly, it's like how often do you get to tell other co-writers and producers how you feel? I mean, you're a pretty emotional guy. Yeah, not pretty and, emotional. But it's it's unusual to be in a place, like a safe place, where you can just sort of say how you actually feel. That's very true. Especially during a recording session, a lot of times you're so focused on like guiding the energy in the room that you can't really put a lot of your own honest energy into the room if you're like having a shitty day. Oh, can I say shitty? It's yeah, a podcast. It's a, it's, yeah, you can say whatever you want. Nothing's like, this is not PG-13 or anything like that. No, no, no. If you're having like a shitty day, obviously that can't go into the room, right? But 
Yeah. Do you have moments where you walk into the session and this is just a terrible day? Oh, man, yeah, all the time. All the time, right? You just wake up or, you know, get a really bad phone call or just have a shitty day in general yeah. and then walk into the room and it's like, hey, let's do an up-tempo that's like yeah. a club banger. And you're like, yeah! And you're yeah. sort of crying inside. Yeah. It kind of makes me look at people like, um, uh, you know, news anchors. I right. don't know if you've ever been on a, a TV show where you... you see these people who have to, it just doesn't matter what their personal life is. Right. They can't. The, every day they have to show up and be like, the weather is. Yeah, exactly. They can't just say like, my at home my, my wife left me and then the weather <laughs> is, you know. <laughs> like you have to go in with that same like with pizzazz. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. But you know what though? The, the, the funniest thing to me is like when they're, when they're doing the news and they have to tell like a really sad story and then follow it up with something really upbeat. So it's like they end it with, and everybody unfortunately did not survive. In other news, Bozo the Clown, and it's yeah. like they have to switch from one to the other. That is so awkward and amazing. I mean, it's it's a learned talent. I don't think that's natural for any human to communicate like that. No, for sure. And somehow we all watch it, so we must have learned how to hear it also. Yeah, for sure. And be, be able to be, oh yeah, that's right, that's that news, and I'm not going to fault this human for having no soul. Yeah, that's... <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, look, you have one of the most unique stories in pop because... You started, and not just pop, songwriting in general, because of where you grew up. Right. And uh, so uh, I want you to just sort of start with uh, with telling me, you know, your childhood, uh, where, you, where you're born. Yeah, I was born in Istanbul, man. I uh, was born and raised in a part of town in Istanbul called Kadiköy, which is um, it's like an art district, I guess you could say, of the city. I grew up, um, for the most part, in my uncle's studio, my uncle's recording studio, so... He had me in there like doing notation and, you know, learning how to cut tape and all that other good stuff in the recordings. Doing notation like you were actually writing out charts? Writing out charts, yep, exactly. Who, did you get a formal education in music? I didn't. He sort of taught me how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, he taught me how to do it. And then uh funny thing is, is that not too long into doing it, he introduced me to this program called Notator that sort of did it naturally. Like we would transcribe. MIDI. Yeah, we would transcribe yeah. all the MIDI. Notator was made by a company called eMagic. I don't know if you're familiar with them. I'm not. Okay, so I'm gonna give I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a quick yeah. I'm gonna give you a quick digital audio workstation lesson. Here we go. Started off as Notator, and then it became Notator Logic after they added music sequencing. And oh then, wow! And then they dropped Notator, and to this day, it's just called Logic. And the function is still in there. You can actually still do notation in Logic. Right. I'm sure you've seen that. Before. Yeah. Sure. But you're like, why is this? It's here? usually because I hit the wrong button. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> you're like, yeah. why? Is, why would anybody use this? Like, yeah, I think um, it's like right next to the mixing mixing console. Exactly. Thing. It's right next to yeah. you hit the wrong button. Yeah, it's yeah. like, no, I didn't want yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want that. That's awesome. <laughs> and then go back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I've been using, um, using them for years. Did Did you start off wanting to be a producer or writer, or Not, did you even have any idea what you were doing? Neither. Yeah. Uh, being around my uncle. First of all, okay, so I'm Turkish, so that makes me a cynic. So being around my <laughs> uncle, being yeah. around my uncle, sort of demonstrated to me how impossible it is to get into the music industry. Like for every one of me, there's like fifty thousand that failed. For every one of you, there's like half a million to a million that totally failed. Right. So I knew how what slim. Mean? What do you mean by that? In other words, for every one person that made it yeah. to the level level that you made it, yeah. There's another 500,000 people that tried, yeah. and now they're like driving Ubers, or they're working at a grocery store, or they're doing security, or whatever. Right. They're not in the music industry. It's difficult, right? It's, 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 it, there's a slim chance. So, so my perspective was always, as a realist, to say, I'm going to learn how to do this so that I can sell the dream to everyone else who's trying to do it. I'm going right. to learn how to do this so I can be the engineer that's working with the songwriter that's trying to get in. I'm going to learn how to do this so I can be the producer who does the track for the singer who's trying to get in. And after, you know, moving to the United States, one of my side hustles was that. Like I would do songs for random people for like 500 bucks a pop, produce and record it. Wait, when, when is all this? When, it, when are you starting to work with your uncle? When, um, is, when are you starting to do this? I started working with him when I was around eight, eight or nine years old. Whoa. In studio. Yeah, I was a kid. Did you speak English then? Um, yeah, yeah, I spoke. 
I was probably about 60 or 70 percent fluent by that point uh -huh. because we start fairly early in Turkey. Like you have to learn at least another language fluently. What's the main language? Turkish. It is Turkish. Okay. It is absolutely Turkish. That would make sense. <laughs> um, do you still speak it? Yeah. I with sure your do. family a lot? Do your kids speak it? Yeah. My kids are learning. Yeah. They're definitely learning. They understand it when I speak it. Their their their, enunci their pronounce pronunciation enunciation which way pronunciation is technically the right way to say that yeah. their pronunciation is not right on point but uh -huh. but they understand it fluently. Is your wife Turkish? Mm -mm, Did she learn any? Uh the curse words. <laughs> <laughs> she cursed at me in Turkish. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, um, so you move here when? Two thousand one. Two thousand one. Uh -huh. Third year where, college. Where did you move? Atlanta, Georgia. Did you, were you, when you say third year of college, were you in school and then you decided to... I was, I was going to Istanbul Technic University. For then, music? No, for networking technology. What is that? That's a guy who basically strings computers together for a living. All right. Yeah. Um, but my focus was in artificial intelligence studies. So that made it possible for me to create like... They call them entities. This is how scary it is. Artificial intelligence entities that existed across multiple computers. That Whoa. was my that was my focus. And then I damn, that's so far ahead of where to start that then. Yeah, this was yeah. back in what two thousand. This explains your love for Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, I'm a sci-fi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Really, yeah. Uh, um, and then I had a chance wow. to transfer. Yeah, and I, I transferred to, to Georgia Tech, which is why I moved to Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. How was that transfer? Difficult. Why? Language barrier being one of them, right? So when I moved to the States, I spoke English fluently, and I could, I could almost pass for a native speaker at that point. I feel like now I could. Every once in a while, the accent jumps out there. But, Yo, but I've been around you many times, and... I don't think I've ever heard a word where I was like, "Oh, that's weird." No. Versus, like, if I say, "Hey, b I, my band," and I'm I, like, my <laughs> Chicago accent's <laughs> worse than your <laughs> your Turkish accent. So, yeah, man. well, I yeah, uh, yeah you've done something right. Mm. But when I first moved here, so if you know anything about Atlanta Airport, it's it's in College Park in Atlanta, right? So here's this airport, this international airport. That's, College Park's a nice part of town, but some of it is in the hood, right? And so I get off the plane, and the person that's supposed to pick me up is not there to pick me up. This is 2001, so I don't have a cell phone. I have to ask for change. So I walk up to this brother, and he's, you know, he's, he's like a environmental services, right? He's mopping the floor. And I was like, um, excuse me, do you have 50 cents that I could borrow? I have to make a phone call in, in what was an accented English. What does that sound like? Um, excuse me, do we have 25 or 50 cents? I'd like to make a phone call. Well, so is that strong? Yeah, it's pretty at strong. Yeah, because wow. I mean, it's, it's Turkish. It's like Eastern European to sure. Middle Eastern. It's like the mix. Sure. So he kind of looks at me and he goes, in his own accent, Shada, you sound funny as hell. Shada, where you from, Shada? And I'm flabbergasted. I'm like, what the hell did he just say to me? What? I said, Shada, you sound funny as hell. Shada, where you from, Shada? I'm like, oh, where am I from? I'm from Turkey. And he goes, Turkey or Kentucky? You don't sound like you're from no damn Kentucky. And I go, man, let me just get 50 cents. That was my first interaction with an American in the United States. Amazing. I lived in the South, man. So it was, I, I mean, every, I couldn't understand anybody the first six months I was there. Were you able to make friends? Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Eventually. Yeah. Um, were you immediately going into music? Like when you were in school, were you? I mean, um, I know you're 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 studying technology, but you've been doing music since you were eight. Were you? You know what? Yeah, I mean, I'm I was going into this. I was going to like gigging and like playing, you know, keys at odd and end places around Atlanta. Um, going to recording studios, you know, for fun or whatever. Not too long after I moved there, I opened opened like a commercial recording production business where, I, like I said, I would charge like five hundred dollars for people to come by and I would produce records and. Do yeah. you know that's what you were doing? Were you like, oh, I'm in the business of producing records? Or no. It was a side hustle. Man. It was extra money. Right. It's extra money. I mean, you know, you're in college. You're broke. So it was extra money. It was a side hustle. Was any of it good? Uh, yes. And the reason I can say that is because some of the stuff that I did during that period started my career, my real career. Right after I graduated from college and started working for a technology company or a networking company, I was still doing the commercial sessions because I enjoyed it. Like, I liked doing it. 
And one weekend, a guy came by and asked me, hey, yeah, let's do three songs together. And I was like, cool. And we did three songs. And that guy, I don't know if you know him, his name is Sterling Sims. Do you know Sterling? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, that's how we met. He was he was an artist back then. And uh, we did like three records together. And six months later, he got signed off of those records. And that's how my career actually started. Whoa. So were you still in school then when he got the No, deal? no, this was after school. After this school was, I was probably point. into the workforce by like a year at that point. Right. But here's, here's what's funny. So I had, my, I had my salary or whatever, and I, I knew what I was making. About six months into it, he gives me a phone. Sterling calls me. He says, yo, man, you want to come up to uh, New York and meet L.A. Reid? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds awesome. Hell yeah, I'll do that. So I hopped on a plane and went to New York. I sit down with L.A. Reid. He's like, yeah, we're going to sign Sterling. I'm like, oh, man, that's great. He's like, yeah, we love your, we love your music. I'm like, oh, man, yeah, that's good too. He's like, oh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to pay you $6,000. I was floored. Sick. I was charging 500 bucks, right? I don't think Sterling ever paid me for those, actually. No, those <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, you're going to pay me six grand for three songs? He's like, no, man, we're going to pay you six grand each. I was like, man, I'm clearly in the wrong business. I need to do what y'all doing over here. And that's, that's, that's when my career started, honestly, sitting in the office, talking to L.A. Reid. So are you sitting across from L.A. being like, I'm moving to New York tomorrow? No. Or are you like, no, okay, great, this is awesome. Send me a check. I'm going to go down to Atlanta. I'm going to... Well, yeah, because you got to remember back then, what, was this 2004? Back then, like, the urban music scene in Atlanta was popping. Yeah, it's a, the hottest place. Yeah, in, so yeah. there was no need for me to go to New York. All the writers and artists that I knew were all in Atlanta already. Right. Um, so after that, I mean, I started. I immediately started working with, like, some of the dopest names in R&B music at the time. People like Mario and Marsha and Bro just from, from Floor Tree and Chris Brown. She's the and, best. Oh, she's amazing. I love she? her. Oh, her voice is nuts, <laughs> man. But uh, does L.A. remember that meeting? He does. So sick. He does remember that meeting. Yeah. It's kind of fun when you meet people on the way up who were friendly, and so you just feel like along, you know, as you, obviously you've done a lot of work with him since. So, yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty cool, and you guys can always wink at each other knowing where it started. For sure, man. Yeah. I was in a meeting with him not too long ago. And did he, I bet he offered you more than $6,000. Yeah, that well, song. you know what? He knows not to mention money <laughs> while we're sitting in a room together. Right, right. I'm like, you know what? Just call right. my management about that. Right. $6,000 to show up to this meeting to talk about the <laughs> <laughs> how much money you're going to pay me for this song. More like um, that. So the first... You know, real record that I could find is 2005 with Chris Brown. That's a different, it's a different level when you have a, a song on a number one album. Yeah. How did that change your, your career at that point? Well, um, that song happened to be my first official release. Whoa. Yeah, that was the first record I yeah. ever had come out like that more than 40 people had heard. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, I'm going to be honest with you, it didn't really change a whole lot because the hype around me as a producer was already sort of really high. So I was already making the rounds and working with like a lot of different artists. I want to say Sterling's album came out not too long after that one came out. Sure. So yeah, it didn't. It changed obviously being on a number one album. I was super proud of that fact. But uh, you know, when you're, when you're junior level creative, you tend to get overshadowed by like the senior people that happen to be on the song. So when people look at that record, they see, oh, Sean Garrett wrote this record. They don't see that some guy named Oak produced it. To to this day, it surprises people when I was like, "Yeah, I produced Ain't No Way for Chris for Chris Brown," and they're like, "What? You did that?" Right. To this day, still. Happens. But that but that's kind of interesting how people's perspective changes because I guess just from my my experience, some you know when you or better yet when you have your a song right now that you show that you wrote then that right. might be relevant now they might hear it with different ears because of how. You know, you have a whole discography, yeah. In between that, so when someone looks back at that now, I don't think that they have. There's no way they have a feeling of, oh, this is one. You know, this name is as big as the other name now. You yeah. Know, at the time, it, your pers- there. If I'm seeing that for the first time, my perspective. I didn't. I mean, I know Sean. I didn't look at that even for a second and think like, oh, that's. Oh well, it's Sean's record. I mean, well, the you good, know what I mean? Yeah. I, I don't. No one who sees it for the first time feels that way. I'd say that now, for sure. Um, I mean, but that's by virtue of the fact that I've had whatever career I've had between sure. then and now. Did but. you expect it? Was your goal to do... Did you have a specific genre you wanted to work in? 
Well, here's the thing, man. When you are a black record producer in Atlanta, Georgia, there's pretty much only one style that they're going to accept from you. So uh, people are surprised to learn that the industry is still very much a segregated industry. Not because... Not because that the, not because there's a prejudice or not because there's like a racism, but because that just sort of naturally is how it shakes out. Right. Um, I noticed a couple of years ago. So do you know Seven, Seven Streeter? Yeah. You know Julia Michaels? Yeah. Two sides of the same industry. One of them is an urban songwriter and artist. The other one is a pop songwriter and artist. Three years ago, although everyone in their prospective sides of the industry knew who they were, they did not know who each other were. Huh. They didn't know each other. Because at the time, I remember asking Julia, do you know Seven? She was like, no. And I remember asking Seven, you know Julia? She was like, no. Yeah, do you get what I'm saying? So yeah. the music industry very much is still sort of split, like between black and white. Right. Back then, it was even more so. If you're in Atlanta and you're black, you are doing rap or R&B, period, point blank. What was ironic for that for me, though, is that I didn't really get acquainted with urban music until after I moved to the U.S. Because I grew up listening to rock. You know what I'm saying? That's the stuff that I listened to growing up. I wasn't like a hip hop head or an R&B head growing up. I listened. I, I was in Istanbul, Turkey. I was like one of eight black people that lived in the whole country. So the music that prevailed was like you know I'd go to like Rage Against the Machine um, uh, concerts and Ozfest and all that other shit. And I listened to like Modest Mouse and all of that. Like that's the style that I kind of grew up listening to. So it wasn't until after I moved to the U.S. and was like, oh, there's this. This is dope. And of course, being a black guy, it appealed to me, I guess, on that level. So I was like, yeah, this is fire. And then learning how to do it and produce it. But prior to that, no, man, I, I, grew, up not, I, I grew up not really exposed to it. This week's episode is sponsored by BMI. At BMI, music moves their world just like it moves mine. BMI is my performing rights organization. They're the bridge between people who create music, like me, and the businesses that bring it to the public. They make sure I get paid when my music is streamed on apps or shows, played on radio, at live shows, or in bars, gyms, basically anywhere where music is played. And they do this for over 900,000 songwriters, composers, and music publishers with more than 14 million songs across genres. But it's more than that. They help us navigate the music industry. They create opportunities for aspiring writers and composers through stages at festivals, song camps, and workshops. And they connect us with the right people. They're also on Capitol Hill fighting for copyright protection and fair royalties. And they work hard to ensure the future of music. They have my back, and they'll have yours. Learn more at BMI.com. Listen, recently I had a friend who told me, hey, you got to have a speaker in your living room that's as good as the speakers that you have in your studio because you're spending all this time uh, writing and recording music for a living, and then you want to play that music for your family and friends. So you don't want to shortchange the speakers that you listen to your music on um, just because you're not in your studio when you're at home. So recently, Sonos sent me a couple speakers, and they're bananas. I mean, truly, like the, it's, it's what we've been playing my new album, The Wrong Man, on for all of our friends and family who come over because the vocal clarity is great, the bass is great, you know, a true spectrum of, of that's, that's clear and transparent, and it's so easy to set up. You take it out of the box, you turn on the app, and it's basically right there for you. You can add whatever speakers you want to it if you want to build a bigger system, but the gist of it is that it's so easy. It's so easy to get. It's so easy to set up. Go to Sonos.com if you want to grab a speaker, two, three, whatever you want, but try Trust me, that is the best speaker that we have had that is not in my studio. So, again, thank you, Sonos, and uh, trust me, go grab some. I think one part of that that's interesting is that when you study rock or that kind of music, you know, that you mention and you go and you write in an urban session, 
I, I find that in those urban sessions, my first my first sessions were all with Dre and Vidal. Okay, yeah, from Philly. Yeah, and which is how I knew Marsha. Oh, cool. You know, I was the one white guy in the session, <laughs> but I was in a band. But I was like, oh, this they they were like, oh no, this guy's a musician. And there was a uh, my first session that was a big name was with Chris Brown and them. Wow. And they flew me. I remember it was I was in Chicago, and they they called and said, "Do you want to come to work with Chris Brown the next day?" And right. I was like, "Yeah, of course." I mean, this Chris Brown in his heyday. I actually think it might be like the day that he took the plea deal with Rihanna. So it was not maybe the best okay. day of his life. <laughs> right. Um, uh, <laughs> um, but I remember going, and there was this, you know, it was a, an entourage of people and all this, and I, there was. One white guy out of twenty people there, and it was me. Right. And somebody went up to Dre and Vidal and was like, "Yo, you got to get rid of that guy." <laughs> Word. Like before we ever started writing or anything, they're like, "No, no, trust me. He's like, he's he's cool. It'll it'll help the songwriting for for you know, you want him to appeal to." Some white people, <laughs> and like, I mean, I always figure I my any you know. I wrote maybe the whitest of Nicki Minaj songs, you know. <laughs> it's like yeah, I, you know, it's like, like monstrous any, plaque sitting up there. <laughs> but but Thank you know you what I mean. Much. It's like I don't. I think that there's like this giant gray area where you can live. Where if you do land in the middle, then that makes your urban songs. When you go to Atlanta, having your background, that's going to make them cross over easier because you're naturally sure. thinking like, oh well, I, yeah, but check out this one. Kind of modest mouse guitar line to build this track off of. Right. Just like I'll be, you know, naturally, I'm going to, you know, I'll be, I'll naturally sing things that sound probably more like a Weezer melody than <laughs> like a ludicrous melody. So, you know, th- those things really, if you, if you land in between genres, especially now, I mean, then it was even different because there were still aisles and stores. Right. But right now, it's like if you land in it the crosses middle, more. Yeah. you know, you win. You you almost win having the background if you have the opposite background. I mean, look, I that was definitely a benefit for me, man. I, I call it the salt on the caramel. I think <laughs> everybody's everybody's so used to making things that taste sweet, and if you come from a salty background and add what you do, yeah, it's unique and it's awesome and it's balanced, right? You seem to have had a really uh, a good childhood. You speak very fondly of your family home yeah, and all that, yeah, sure. yeah, definitely, man. I mean, I I had my difficulties growing up. Um, you know, anybody does, right? But well, by, like what? Oh well, the the challenge of being, like I said earlier, literally one of the only black people in the whole country, like. Yeah, you know there might be, and you a, might not be the like the smallest human. Not the so smallest like, human on earth. So, yeah, so yeah, like right. they're they got, they're definitely noticing. Yeah, so yeah. I stood out. I stood out whether I was famous or infamous. I definitely stood out while I was yeah. there. Yeah. Um, Why would you say infamous? Um, were you aggressive or something? No. <laughs> like wasn't what aggressive. is it? What is it infamous? Mean? Well, what I mean by that is is when you are unique and you stand out, people are going to either really like you or really hate you. Oh. Uh, you know what I mean? If you don't stand out and you blend in and people like you, they just kind of like you. If they don't like you, they say, ah, I don't know about that guy. But if you stand out and you're a sore thumb, people tend to have stronger opinions. So yeah. it takes less, less action on your part for people to form that strong opinion. Did and you think that there was racism in Turkey? Yeah, for sure. Uh. Definitely. I think that it's not as defined as pro- and as pronounced as it is here in the United States. Racism is a strong word. There were people that definitely had a prejudice. They would prejudge you based on how you looked. And sometimes it wasn't negative. Sometimes they would just automatically assume that you could sing, or they'd automatically assume oh. that you were great at playing basketball or football, which I happen to be a good football player, but like <laughs> <laughs> they tend to believe that you were, you know, you know, they'd give you, they'd put the stereotype on you. Uh. Or sometimes it would be ignorance, man. Like one time I was on a bus, I was maybe 14 years old. This little girl, this little Turkish girl is like staring up at me. And then she goes like this on my leg because I was wearing shorts. She goes, she rubs, she rubs her finger across my leg and then looks at her finger to see if the blackness had rubbed off to her finger. Uh. And I thought it was funny at the yeah. time, right? It's ignorance. It's, it's, it's innocent ignorance, right? But then some, there are some people over there that sort of get cues from, from people who have a little bit more experience with the ugly side of racism and they emulate it. There are those people there too. There are those people everywhere, in my opinion. 
Did you ever feel uh, any sort of racism with you know in in the music industry? Other than I mean, I get the 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 genre segregation, but did you ever feel any racism? Uh, I mean, there have been times when certain A and R's, especially early in my career, wouldn't give me a shot on certain projects just because of me being a black guy. Like if I was new and they hadn't really heard anything I'd done, yeah, they sort of judged me as soon as I walked through the door. Like I'm here to work on. Well, I'm not going to name projects because then you'll know what A&Rs I'm talking about, right? <laughs> I'm here to work on this pop female that you have. You? Really? Yeah. You do? Where are you from? Yeah. Istanbul. You're, what? You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah, I definitely encountered that. And yeah. it was like, nah, I don't want to give him a chance. Do you work with those A&R people now? I try not to. I try not to have... I hold a grudge, man. I try not to have contact with any of those people. You hold grudges? Yeah. Why? I'm, a, I'm an emotional person, like you said earlier. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a very emotional person. Yeah. So I definitely hold grudges. Um, so, you know, after 2005, you write a bunch of records, you write a lot more records, you have a bunch of records that do well, and then <laughs> you meet Pop. Pop Wanzel. You got to go down this, you know, I, I need to know about, oh, you know, God. if you guys, here's your infamy, you know, you guys, you guys become <laughs> Pop and Oak. It's hard to get, you know, that's as big of a name in, in pop since I've been working in music. You know? Man, listen. Um, tell me the story of Pop and Oak. Pop and Oak was the result of an argument I was having with my then manager. Um, so do you remember Icebox by Omarion? Yeah. And you remember that was one of the first records that I incorporated love that record. great song, right? Yeah. But what made that song such a forward-thinking record is that it incorporated what would usually be in trance music into an R&B song, like this arpeggiated synth. You didn't really hear that in R&B prior to that. Right at that point, R&B started making this shift to like a more electronic thing, right? Four on the floor. Pop, 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 pop music. Everybody's moving in that direction. Let's move away from R&B music and do pop music. Unless you were doing pop R&B, you were doing old school R&B. Like this was the thought process, right? And so my mentality, being the guy who grew up listening to rock music and pop music and alternative music and like Tricky, not Tricky Stewart, but the European Tricky, like listening to all that kind of stuff, I was all for that shift. I was like, this feels natural to me. I mean, I love R&B music. I love urban music, but this feels more natural. So I'm telling my manager, I really want to focus on this. And he goes, well, why don't you want to stay with urban music? I said, urban music doesn't really offer anything new right now. And he's like, I think you're making a mistake. Because urban music, like, like culture flows from, and this was his, his, his thought process at the time, music culture flows from black to white. I was like, well, what do you mean by that? He goes, a lot of times when you have genres of music, it starts on the black side. R&B started black. Rock and roll started black. Blues started black. A lot of different genres started black and they flowed into mainstream culture and became lighter and lighter and lighter as it went. You want to stick with the source. You don't want to go with the flow. You'll flow out. You'll be gone. Smart guy. Um, I was dumb at the time. I wasn't listening. So he enlisted pop in that argument. Pop, to me, represents the embodiment of soul music. His father is Dexter Wanzel, who was a producer for Philly International back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. He's from the most soulful city in America, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And he understands that culture very, very well. So Donnie, my, my ex-manager, tells me, hey man, I want to introduce you to this kid. He's going to give you a, a, a new appreciation for it. So he flies from Philly to Atlanta. We sit down and we have an hour-long conversation. And the ego side of me says, I got a lot I can teach this kid. Because he didn't know anything about digital audio workstations and you know, running a room as a producer. And he doesn't know anything about AI. He doesn't, like, right, I got exactly. <laughs> he doesn't know anything about artificial, artificial intelligence right. and routes and switches. He doesn't know anything about that. But the ego side of me is like, I got a lot to teach this kid. It wasn't until later that I realized I learned just as much from him as he learned from me. Yeah. And well, he um, grew up with it too, and in, 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 in a, such a professional way yeah. that 
there's there's something with people who grow grow up with that as their second language. For sure. So they they understand things like recording and touring in in a way that you you just you, there's nothing. It's you know our parents aren't famous musicians or right. weren't in, involved in it. So of course we're not going to have that language. Yeah, exactly. But that's his. You know, that's his. If yeah, not his, that might be his first language. You yeah, know? exactly. So that's a a great partnership there. No, he 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 definitely brought a lot of appreciation for like the root of urban culture to to my to my world and i brought a lot of appreciation for sort of more alternative culture to his world and understanding things like pop melody and symmetry and writing a song yeah things like that like things did that, someone teach you that or were you just just because uh, you would listen to records yeah that sort of was like a natural thing for me yeah yeah i don't know i mean you can be you know like when this. everyone obviously we talk about things like song math all the time or, right. or composition or whatever you want to call it. But um, I guess when you're doing charts all the time, when you're eight, <laughs> right. you're probably really good at being like, oh yeah, this A section <laughs> comes back again. Exactly. You know, you start to emulate what you know. So exactly. I, I think some people don't want to actually do the, the basic homework. So yeah. they, they miss out on it. I mean, but, that's, that started early for me, man, just growing, yeah. up, growing up in a studio. Yeah. So the concept of sequencing was yeah, like I guess when you think about your uncle, too, being in, it's like both you and Pop were able to... We have that in common. Yeah. You know, yeah. We definitely have that in common. Um, I think that's why we connected because we both kind of came from a background that made it a second a second nature thing. Yeah. So um, how quickly after you guys started writing together did you start having success together? Uh, almost immediately. Um, I want to say your love was like the fifth or sixth record we ever did together. Okay. Which wasn't intended to even be a record that saw the light of day. It was. <laughs> yeah, it was something that. Pop recorded the hook and attached it to an email to send to himself. Forgot to send the email. Later on in the day, sent an email to Nikki because he'd had a relationship with Nikki from like a long sure. time ago. Um, sent an email to Nikki about something unrelated, and that song was attached to the email. And she hit him back saying, "Yo, this is dope." And then uh, she wrote verses and sang the hook, but she was uh, hesitant about putting it out because nobody had ever, had ever heard her sing before that. Right. Uh, I guess I'm sort of jumping ahead to that record, but yeah. I mean, it's fine. It's 2010. Yeah, Let's they, go for it. Yeah, that's around that period. So the record leaks. The record leaked, man, and it it charted as a leak. It, it jumped up to like 46 on the Hot 100 as a leaked record with like no label push. Th- that's that's really sort of the first time. And I, I, mean, I mean, I know you have some songs that are... are Crossing over, and you have you have, but but that's that's such a superstar at that point. That's really like the point where she really breaks. Yeah, you know. So to be part of that is is one step further than even working with big names is one thing. Working with an artist like that and the be, sort of the beginning of their real pop career is a whole other level. Man, breaking an artist is one of the best things you can do as a producer or or, or as a writer. But it takes such risk, doesn't it? I yeah. mean, you just when you work with a famous name, your floor is so high because you you assume that they'll they'll sell a certain amount of units because that's what they've done, right? But when you have that new artist, I mean, the floor could be well, I mean, as low as it can go, and you know, so it's hard it's hard to take that risk. We can all sit here though as musicians and say that we're all risk takers. You are, I am. Anybody who's in the music industry is a risk taker. There's no net for this job. Yeah. You know, you fail, you fail. But I'm happy. I'm happy that I was able to, because it was her first successful single. And I think it was the record that sort of put her in the mainstream. She'd had features prior to that, like that monster feature she did. Right. With, I mean, obviously, that really, right. really put her on the map as a rapper. But yeah. as an artist, I feel like your love put her on the map. Did you feel pressure to repeat after something like that or was it sort of are you in this mode of just creativity where it's like oh well this is just sick this is happening over here i'm in a studio i mean you don't seem to be that um affected by outside pressure but am i wrong by that not at all man i'm i'm not the only pressure i have is for delivering for the artist the day of i get nervous before sessions Oh, interesting. Yeah. I get is, the, so you prepare a lot before an artist comes in? Yeah, or? I prepare a lot. I do a lot yeah. of homework on the artist and I do a, a lot of mental preparation. But I am, I'm a nervous wreck before every session. 
that that's that's the extent of pressure but as far as like repeat success and catching another hit and catching i mean obviously we all want to we all want to catch big records but i'm just glad to be able to make a living making music dog and if i catch a hit hmm. along the way then i catch it along the way why are you and pop why did you go and do go sort of your separate ways or maybe you guys didn't really go your separate ways but pop and i were managed by the same person for a long time Pop made a decision to sort of go another way regarding that. And right around that time, I wanted to explore different avenues and do different styles. Mm -hmm. um, there were certain artists that I was really interested in working with that Pop didn't have the same interest. But the truth is, is that throughout our careers, we always were separate producers. We've always been that. Like there are records that he's done on his own. There are records that I've done on my own that did well in whatever perspective, you know, genres they're in. And every once in a while during that period, we would come together and do stuff. But me and Pop have never been a formal partnership. Like, we all, we just genuinely fuck with each other as people. Yeah, and everyone just started calling, you know. It's, Everybody just assumed. It's everyone else's saying, like, oh, you know, popping up, popping up, popping up. Right, exactly. And it's not necessarily, well, yeah, cool, we're, you know. Like people yeah. would probably assume that Jimmy Fallon and Justin Timberlake were like a formal group if if you took if you took that thinking to that level, right? Me and Pop are just really close. Like we're really close friends. So it's like, hey man, what are you doing? Oh man, I'm doing such, 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 such. Hey, why don't you come up to the studio, man? Let's cook. Because he and I bonded over that. He's a really good cook. Yeah. Um, and I'm a really good eater. <laughs> <laughs> See what I did there? Um, I like that. See that? I like that you came you came into our kitchen and the first thing you thought of is like, oh, I could cook some food in this oh, place. Oh, man, you have an amazing kitchen yeah. there, bro. Come on. It's another one. I mean, look, man, it is so, I, you know, you say, yeah, it's, the, it's great to break an artist. Right. But I've had a lot of singles for artists that are major label artists, that are new artists, and it just didn't work for right. one reason or another. And it seems to have happened at multiple times for you. So why does here work? Why does why do Alicia Cara songs? How did that break through? She is unequivocally herself in all of her music. I'd be lying if I said to you that every artist I worked with was the same. I do know that some artists have a caricature of themselves that they project. I know that. I'm not going to name any names. Because you and I both know a lot of the same people. So I don't want to get shot. But there are some people who, as artists, put on a little extra something. And then they project that out there. And not that they're being disingenuous or being fake. Because, you know, you have to have yourself in the music that you make. But at the end of the day, it's wrestling, in my opinion. It's wrestling. Hulk Hogan was really Terry Bollea. Now, he might have been a very patriotic guy, you know, in his real life. But I doubt that he wore red and yellow as much as he did on, on, on the canvas, right? Right. Alessia is the antithesis of that idea. She is who she is all the time. At home, in, you know, in that environment, in the studio, being interviewed, out shopping, on stage, you know, at a swimming pool, whatever, whatever she randomly happens, she is the same person in every situation and almost unapologetically so. And she also happens to be one of those rare people who are talented enough as a songwriter to capture the essence of what it is she, she wants to say and who she is. And people, I think, relate to that. They understand that, right? I mean, just the concept of that first record here. How many of us have been in that situation? And it's not cool to talk about how whack a party is. You know, in the music industry, we're taught to be, yo, this party is live. This party is hype. I'm drunk. I'm having a good time. This party sucks. Let's write a song about that because that's how I feel. And, uh, and she did. And I think a lot of other people felt the same way. And then Scars You're Beautiful comes out, and that's sort of the, you know, it's... The, the timeliness of it probably couldn't have nailed that any yeah, more sure. than you did. Stars aligned, man, for that record, for sure. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is just, it's just interesting when you find somebody who's that young 
who then teams up with a producer that's that venerable and somehow that whole I love thing how works. I love how I'm venerable. Is yeah, yeah. I love can, that word in, in relation to us. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's just know. a nice way to say old as hell. <laughs> you know, they're they're venerable producers that are almost dead. <laughs> you know, that are closer. Foot in the grave. Yeah, exactly. Hey, man, um makes the music better. One of the hardest it's like you're closer to you know, you're closer to seventy than you are to zero. Wow. Good point. That, you know, yeah, geez, you're right. You, guess, you I, live with you're that. gonna trigger my midlife cri- crisis yeah, yeah. like today. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna leave here and get an earring and buy a sports car if I could fit in one. Man, I took <laughs> I took my earrings out once I had a beard. Did, I was oh. like, it's just too many accessories. Okay. <laughs> too many things to too many things to keep up with. Yeah, she uh, Alessia is a very intelligent person. She's yeah. a scary intelligence. Yeah, she's almost intimidatingly intelligent. Like yeah. talking to her. And that definitely makes it into her music, I think. So intelligence was something that I thought is interesting because when we have sessions, I feel like we have long conversations about things other than the music industry or the music industry in depth. Right. And you have you think about the the world in a in a in a worldly way because you literally are from across the planet. Right. Um, do you find that you're able to use your intelligence in pop music, you know, are um, you, do you are you challenged? Yes, um, I feel like oh, who is it that Picasso, who uses his intelligence to paint a painting that a child would paint? You kind of have to unlearn how to be complex, which in and of itself is a very difficult thing to do. It's like a mental exercise. But then apply that to the role of a producer, which is to get a room full of people to think that way. You get what I'm saying? Like simplicity, the lowest common denominator appeal to the, you know, we try to make records that as many people as possible love. So you got to appeal to as many people as possible, which means you got to appeal to the lowest common denominator. Not to say the dumbest, but just the most relatable, right? Get a a room full of people the songwriter who is smarter than everybody, the songwriter who can write 60 different melodies in four different keys, the keyboard player that, like, you know, went to Berkeley. God, you know, God bless Berkeley. I love that place as an institution. But some of the people that come out of Berkeley, sometimes they come to my studio and they honestly piss me off. Sometimes they come to the studio and it's like, oh, let's add this crazy chord that I have to use my fucking elbow to play. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Chill out on that, okay? There's some people that I know that from Ber- that came from Berkeley and really understand the concept of being a, an amazing musician is not the same as being somebody who writes hit songs. Applying that psychological sort of juju over a room, I think, requires a lot of thought. It's a lot of application. And so you have to apply yourself a lot. And yeah, it is a challenge, absolutely. You're a businessman. I am. Outside of the music industry. Absolutely. And I don't know if people know that about you. Hmm. So I think you should tell people how much of a businessman you is. How much am I a businessman? <laughs> I'm not a businessman. I'm a businessman. No, I'm I am. a businessman. Mm. No, but I think people don't realize that, you know, I, uh, a lot of us have hobbies, but you're you're a businessman. <laughs> and I thought that when, when we were talking, uh, maybe it was a couple sessions ago, and you were telling me about some of the things that you have going on and, you know, yeah, that I, are just outside of the music industry, it's man, I'm, what am I doing with my time? I'm obviously not working hard enough. You yeah, know? No. I definitely own multiple businesses outside of the music industry. I um, Because uh, I'm Turkish. Like I said, I'm a cynic. I think that at any moment, and, and a pessimist. So at any moment, my career as a producer could potentially be over. Like a career's sh- a producer's shelf life tends to be fairly short. Why? Um, I, think it's, I think it's attention span. I think, you know, if you get caught slipping and you're not, like, staying ahead of the curve, which is a constant effort, I think you could become irrelevant really quickly. And we've seen it happen with, like, multiple guys. Like, I, I think of the year, excuse me, the year that I started um, in 2005, and I can't think of any producers that are still around from those days when I started. Mm, yeah. Like, I can't think of any. Like, like I really. Do you think it's because they become irrelevant, or do you think it's because they have other pursuits? I think both. I I think they make a fair amount of money, and then they're like, ah, you know, the effort of staying ahead of the curve is too much of an effort, and I don't want to do that anymore. Or they 
don't stay ahead of the curve and nobody returns your phone calls. But it happens quickly that I've noticed. All the producers and writers that I know that sort of aren't in the game anymore, they all told me, man, one day it was all good and the next day my schedule was just empty and I could not fill it. And that's fucking scary. Like, as a producer and as a writer... Yeah, it just made my stomach drop. Right? I'm sure it did. It scares the shit out of me. Like, when your livelihood depends on the attention span of the music industry, I love my fellow musicians. And when they're together to do something that's worthwhile, like the Music Music Modernization Act thing that you so amazingly helped organize, kudos, man, for sure, for that, by the way. Um, Doing it. You absolutely killed it, man. But... When we put our heads together and we want to get something done, yeah, we can definitely do that. But sometimes we can be real mercurial people, man. You know, we'll watch a show for like 30 seconds and then pick up our phones and look at Instagram and miss half of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, like that's us. Your livelihood can't depend on that. So a lot of the money that I've made over the years has gone into other pursuits and other businesses. Like um, I'm opening a cigar bar in Atlanta um, that's opening in January. And I'm looking forward to that, actually. I'm really looking forward to that. I don't smoke that often, but I will be there. Come on, man. And uh, I will smoke a cigar with you for yeah. that. We're going to have cigars and hookah. It's going to be awesome. Well, we were with uh, uh, our friend Nick Jonas last time. He brought some he quality did. cigars from from Cuba. So that was very nice of him. Yeah. Um, so in this next segment, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to list five people, and you just tell me the first thing that comes off the top of your head. Oh, jeez. I hate All these. All right. I hate these. It's like a terrible Rorschach test. That's what this is. All right. Uh, L.A. Reid. Career starter. Pop wins out. Brother. Sterling Sims. Uh, hell of a drinker. He's the only guy I know that can drink more than I can. <laughs> no, seriously, he'll drink me under a table, and I can drink, bro. Seriously. One of my first sessions, I think, was with him. Also, <laughs> it was at, at a with um uh uh this uh the stereotypes. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah he's close to them too. Yeah. Yeah, I was just, that's he's he's uh he's great. I know we talked about her, but Alessia Cara. Uh, prodigy. Uh, Lucas Keller. Oh man, the first word that comes to my mind. This is terrible. I love you to death, Lucas. Bulldog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm glad that I'm on his side. Yeah. I'm really glad that I'm on his side because otherwise he would scare the hell out of me. And I'm 6'5". <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what's something that you would tell up-and-coming songwriters? Give me what's a call. Advice? There's no other way to do it. Just call me. Really? Yeah, just call me. Anybody else, including Ross? They're not going to help you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> well, you have a pu- you have a publishing company. You know, you you are. I do. You know, I said I, I said in the intro that you know you're you're looking out for the next generation of writers already, even though you are actually really young, regardless of what you think. <laughs> but you're already looking out for them, and you're already building a, a publishing company, and yeah. you you know you've signed. You have you have a, a this the house in in. Sherman Oaks with yeah. the studio, you have rooms where multiple people are making music. Absolutely. So uh, why why are you doing that? that? And be careful when you offer that, by the way. <laughs> we, you're going to get a lot of listeners on this, and so for all you guys, knock yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. I'll give you yeah. my email address. No, right. um, I am a teacher, man. I really am. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of naturally a teacher. I, I can be long-winded and full of myself, and I think those are the two prerequisites to be a teacher. <laughs> so, um, a true professor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But on top of that, man, like, you know, but we've both been through so much bullshit in the music industry. How often, how awesome would it have been to have a person sort of guiding you that had good intentions? Right before I moved to the States, my uncle told me something that I never forgot, man. He said, I want you to pay attention to one thing. Over here, being in Turkey, if you sign a shitty deal, the fault is on the person that gave you the deal. Over there, if you sign a shitty deal, it's your fault. Whoa. And that scared me when he said that, because it's like, not to say that there's a lack of morality in the United States, but I can definitely say that I've, I've witnessed a lack of morality in the music industry in the United States. So... My goal was to give people a safe haven. Like, look, you're not going to get screwed. You're going to have real opportunities. Like when I first signed uh, the orphanage guys, Trevor and Zaire, or William Zaire Simmons and downtown Trevor Brown, (laughs) um, I told both of them, 
you know, you're going to get an opportunity to, to be in almost every session that I'm in so that you can get, you know, the credits that you're going to need to then go off and have your own careers. And whether that means you continue to work with me after that or not, you will have had that stepping stone to get to that point. And I feel like, man, if you put good energy out, you get good energy back, right? Yeah, that, that should inspire some loyalty, too. I think when you give open up doors for people and... But isn't that the point? And, you know, yeah, sure. Like, why right. sign somebody if you're not going to open up doors? Right. Unless your only intention is to bleed them dry. And I can't think of a more evil thing to do to a human. Let me just take you and your dreams and benefit off of it and then discard you when I'm done. Ugh. Like, that's, there's a special place in hell for those people. So my goal is to, is to create, like, a, a center for gifted students, <laughs> right? Sort of like uh, Charles Xavier's. Where? Uh, Sukasa, my studio. For them to come and learn the trade and understand what it is and get opportunities. And if they're good, shine, get placements, get number one records, get plaques, and then go have a career. Yeah. And then turn around and say, yo... Oak, okay. Oak is my OG. Yeah, you know so I mean? that they're one. Of, so you're one of the five that that get named when <laughs> you know when exactly when it's their right. turn to get interviewed. Um, That's exactly right. Bro. Do your kid? Do your kids have any idea what what you do? Uh, yeah, yeah. They learned early because they. I was I was fortunate enough to produce the end title for Moana. Yeah. Um, which was a song that oh, Alessia right. sang. Yeah. yeah. Right. I just saw that. That thing's incredible. Yeah, great a movie. Great movie, man. Yeah. It's a really good movie. And so I I was able to produce the end title song that Alessia did at the end of the record. And my kids were fascinated by the fact that daddy did that song. Yeah. And they're like, well, what does it mean you did that? My oldest one especially. He's five now. He's like, what, did you, what does it mean you did that song? Can you show me? I was like, uh -oh. sure. And then I played in the <laughs> studio and yeah. did, the, did a track. And he was like, oh. And I'm like, you better not think about doing yeah. it. <laughs> you go be a lawyer or a scientist or a doctor No, but or for something. real though, if they wanted to do it, you'd support the hell out of, of it. Of course I would. Yeah. yeah, of course, man. I mean, it would scare the hell out of me. But yeah, of course. Yeah. It, it because... But why you think med you think medicine's a more stable career these days? Um, it's not about career stability, but... it. it if you're a musician, you don't have a choice. If you're a failing musician, you're going to continue to be a failing musician because you love music. Yeah. How many like guitar players that we know that are okay are still gigging for 50 bucks a gig, barely getting by because they love music? Like music is a very harsh mistress, man. Like if she likes you, then, you know, we're lucky. She likes us now. I think that's that John <laughs> Coltrane thing where he was, he was married a, a couple times and it was like, you know, Whoever he marries is the mistress. He's, you know. Yeah, music is the wife. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, that, that bug is, that bug is, that bug is a motherfucker. It's funny. I, I, my, my mom used to say to people, you know, like, oh, he's a struggling musician. And I said, can you just call me a musician? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> really? Is, really? Like, I'm just a musician. Just because yeah. I'm broke <laughs> is, ir is irrelevant. Because, yeah. And I can tell you now, like, I'm still struggling. <clears throat> yeah. In different ways, but. You know. I don't know, bro. It doesn't well, look like you're struggling you know. to me. <laughs> what is it? We're sitting in this beautiful location. But anyway, so where were we? Um, um, no, but for real, man, first of all, thank you for doing this. Hey, man, thank you for inviting me. Bro. Um, I I always enjoy, you know, every every single episode we talk about how it's more important to have a good day than a good song. Amen. And I know that if we have a session that we'll sit there and I'll learn something from you because you're very smart and... Um, you know, the Music Modernization Act, which uh, by the time this comes out will have passed. Amazing. Uh, the president could sign it today, but he hasn't, so probably tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, awesome. You know, he's got basically the end of this week. But I put up a GoFundMe. I don't mean to blow up your spot, but I'm going to. Uh -huh. um, I put up a, a GoFundMe for one day, and we raised... You know, I think like eighteen thousand dollars in a day. Yeah. But because of that, I was able to buy billboards in in Portland and Salem to troll widen and <laughs> bought. You know, we h help pay for different things throughout the country for, you know, stuff in Colorado, stuff in Virginia, stuff in Boston. You know, um, you know, and the reason why I said some cities, some states is because they were more spread out. Right. But really started to look at what 
you know what we could do with that. But you were you were very generous in your donation, and <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think what it says is that none of us, none of us are doing we're fight are fighting for the Music Modernization Act so that we get paid more. Right. We're doing it so that the next generation has a fair shake, and exactly. that the music industry becomes right, exactly, and becomes fair, and that we change it to making it about this generation and not about the way it was, right? And you know, to find people who are like-minded in in our generation, I, you know, I, I appreciate it because I don't feel so alone in that effort, <laughs> right. and it was nice to see. It was it was really nice to see you leading the way with that because it's it's hard. We we all went and we've all been, you know, we're putting our names on the line and it's possible that we could get some, you know, there could be some repercussions, but none of us gave a shit. Right. And we were like, no, this is the right thing to do. Let's go. <clears throat> That's exactly and right. And we man. just did it. And you, you're a big part of that. And uh, so uh, genuinely thank you for that. Most you know. thank you, man. It was an honor and a privilege to be to just be a footnote in that situation, man. Yeah, man. I, I think uh, I think we owe it to we owe it to the people that we teach to replace us. Yeah, we owe it to them for sure. Yeah. Well, you're a good teacher. Thank you, <laughs> and uh, have a good session today. Oh, man. Thank you, All man. Right. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of And The Writer Is. If you want to hear music from this songwriter I just interviewed, be sure to check out our Spotify playlist or visit our website at andthewriteris.com. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to us. You can also like us on Facebook and Twitter. And The Writer Is is produced by Joe London, edited by Miles Bergsma, and published by Big Deal Music. A special thanks to David Silberstein from Mega House Music and Michael White. Until next time, this is Ross Golding.